Muslims view Islam as a very beneficial religion, not just in a moral sense to help govern society, but also when it comes to the aspect of health. So let's look at 10 ways Islam helps you stay healthy according to Muslims. Starting at number 10, eating slowly. There's an Islamic teaching that encourages Muslims to actually take their time to eat. You know, slow down, chew your food properly before you just gulp down and swallow everything. This is because it takes your brain some time to actually register that your stomach is full. So eating slowly actually helps make sure that you don't consume any excess food before your brain gets the signal that you're full. Also, another benefit that's noted on top of, you know, not overeating is that you can actually enjoy your food a lot more. And you know, I've experienced that because when I chew my food and just enjoy it and just take my time with it, I love it more and I love food already. Also, moderation in diet is another principle in Islam. This is something that is greatly stressed, so not having too much as well as not having too little. Not just when it comes to food, but like anything in life. There's actually a verse in the Quran, as a matter of fact, it's verse 31 of Surah Al-Araf, and it says, eat and drink, but be not excessive. Indeed, he likes not those who commit excess. Also, there is a hadith narrated by Termizi, and that hadith says this, one third of the belly with food, another third with drink, and leave one third empty for easy breathing. So definitely you want to eat enough so that your body does get the nutrients. You don't want to starve yourself or anything, but you also don't want to eat too much. So everything in moderation. Again, this principle applies to not just food, but other aspects of life as well. Number eight, waking up early. This is another benefit. Prophet Muhammad, as a matter of fact, he got up and he prayed very early. On one occasion, he was reported to say these words, Oh Allah, bless my nation in their early mornings. You'll find another passage about waking up early in the Hadith. And this one is narrated by Sunan Ibn Majah. When the Prophet used to set out his army, he would send them at the beginning of the day. Sakir al-Gamdi was a man engaged in trade. He used to send his goods out at the beginning of the day and his wealth grew and increased. So there you go. This is also another passage that Muslims look to as some good business advice. Number seven, also there's a principle of disease control found in Islam. Muslims believe that this stems all the way back to the Prophet Muhammad over 1300 years ago. If you weren't even familiar with the term pandemic by now, I'm sure all of you have probably gotten tired of hearing that term. It's reported that Prophet Muhammad said these words, if you hear of an outbreak of a plague in a land, do not enter it. But if the plague outbreaks out in a place while you are in it, do not leave that place. Kind of sounds like quarantine and social distancing. It's also reported that he said these words, those with the contagious diseases should be kept away from those who are healthy. Again, that's a very important health principle because if somebody is infectious, of course, one of the best options is to isolate them so that the disease doesn't spread until they get better. There's another benefit found in terms of alcohol consumption in Islam, not that you to drink alcohol though, but this is actually a prohibition of alcohol. Alcohol causes many different diseases in the body. It damages your liver, it reduces concentration, and it can also lead to diseases like cancer as well as Alzheimer's disease. So because of all the negative aspects of alcohol, this is why it's forbidden in Islam. Number five brings us to ablutions known as wudu and guzl. These are considered to be very important aspects when it comes to prayer in Islam. On a regular basis, it's even said that Muslims cannot perform prayers with having a body that's not clean or even in a place that's dirty. So before prayers, you're to wash yourself. Of course, it is a good practice to just make sure that you wash away all the dirt and bacteria. So on top of the spiritual symbolism in this practice, it also is a good practice to just keep your body washed and clean. Which kind of leads us to our next point, actually, when we talk about hygiene. So hygiene, of course, you know, washing your body, but also also keeping your mouth clean, brushing your teeth, using some mouthwash or whatever, putting on some deodorants, keeping yourself just really nice and well-groomed really helps to reduce any kind of disease or bacteria festering on your body or inside of your body. It's believed by Muslims that the Prophet Muhammad said these words, the Archangel Gabriel continuously ordered me to clean my teeth until I thought it would be made compulsory. Muslims are also advised to make sure that they keep their fingers 
fingernails cut as well because you know bacteria can get caught under them. Number three deals with exercising. Now the Quran doesn't specifically mention any kind of exercise to do but it's believed that the Prophet Muhammad's life was completely filled with all sorts of different recommendations to make sure that you stay active. Prophet Muhammad he advised Muslims to actually teach their children how to do things outside like go swimming, how to ride a horse, how to shoot bow and arrows. Also it's reported that he himself would walk at a very fast pace and even he would race with his wife Aisha. There's also a lot of emphasis put on doing other physical activities around the house, cleaning up in the kitchen, just doing everyday chores, cutting firewood, whatever, just staying active. Number two leads us to prayer. Now this is something that's not necessarily seen as something that can actually keep you healthy. But according to Muslims, just that repetitive physical movement and activity that you're doing while you're praying, it actually reduces your chances of developing lower back pains if you do it properly. Also, it's reported that studies have shown that doing prayers, it actually helps to eliminate anxiety. And we all know that anxiety can actually affect our body in a negative way. At number one, this leads us to fasting. And fasting is something that is obligatory for all healthy adult Muslims to do during the month of Ramadan. Fasting helps you to balance out your diet. It helps to improve blood cholesterol. It helps reduce gastric acidity and also prevents constipation and other type of digestive issues. Of course, do not fast in excess because if you do that it can prove detrimental although there are some benefits that can come out of fasting over in the Quran it says these words O you who believe fasting is prescribed to you as it was prescribed to those before you so that you can learn taqwa which is good deeds and having your mind on God and that's found in Surah 2 verses 183 we have number 10 first at birth there are some practices there. When a child is born, Islam encourages the Muslims to maintain a high level of cleanliness and purity concerning him or her, as this has a great impact on the mind and the soul of that child. Now, if parents neglect this duty, they should answer before God for the consequences. Similarly, circumcision of the male child, preferably on the seventh day, is a mandatory Islamic custom. Now, that is because it prevents the child against possible infections. Number nine, we have ablutions, which are wudu and ghusl. So ablutions, wudu and ghusl are considered as very crucial parts for prayer or salat in Islam. In fact, under normal circumstances, a Muslim cannot offer prayers with an unclean body, clothes, or having a dirty place. Muslims are also encouraged to clean with pure water and keep it safe from any other forms of impurities. There's also some practices when it comes to personal hygiene. Of course, cleanliness of the intimate parts of the body with water or other cleansing materials after using the bathroom are parts of Islamic customs. Similarly, Muslims are encouraged to clip their nails regularly as well as shave their hair and their armpits and other hair on different parts of their body just to be as hygienically clean as possible. There's also some practices when it comes to oral hygiene. So Muslims are encouraged to trim their mustaches in order to make it easier for you to eat food. It's not getting caught up in your hair or anything like that. So definitely you're encouraged to keep your mouth clean, have a good physical appearance, as well as use fragrances. Even Muslims look at the statement of the Prophet Muhammad that says, Gabriel continuously ordered me to clean my teeth until I thought it would be made compulsory. Now let's look at food hygiene in Islam. So in the Quran, as well as the narrations or the hadith, there's a lot of emphasis that's been put on cleanliness and purity of foods and drink. So there's a lot of importance attached to this because it has to do with the well-being of your body as well as the soul. And Islam encourages the entire human race, not just Muslims actually, to consume hygienically and consume pure and lawful foods. So pretty much eat as healthy as possible. And it also forbids the consumption of certain foods like certain animals like dogs and pigs and the use of intoxicants. And number five, we have exercising and maintaining health. Although there's no verse in the Quran specific when it comes to exercise recommendations, but Muslims take a look at the Prophet Muhammad's life for recommendations. So he advised all Muslims to teach their children how to swim, teach them to do archery, ride on horseback, and he himself used to walk at a very fast pace and even race with his wife. Also, he used to work with his hands, whether at home or when he was out with his companions, collecting firewood, all sorts of things. So he was physically active and Muslims look at that as 
an example to stay physically active as well. Now we talked about this briefly, but alcohol consumption is forbidden in Islam. This is probably the most popular dietary restriction. According to the health website, webmd.com, not only does alcohol cause cirrhosis of the liver as well as reduce concentration, but it can also contribute to conditions like cancer as well as cardiovascular disease and even Alzheimer's. Now the practice at number three is moderation in your diet. So inside of Islam, they emphasize moderation. So not too much, not too little in every aspect of life. Now the second half of verse 31 of Surah Al-Araf states, eat and drink, but be not excessive. Indeed, he likes not those who commit excess. Now there's a hadith that advises Muslims to leave one third of the belly with food, another third with drink, and leave another third empty for easy breathing. And of course, when it comes to diet, science has shown us that eating too much can actually contribute to weight gain and obesity, as well as many other health concerns that come from that. Similarly, eating too little can result in your body not receiving the nutrients that it needs, which also has its own slew of medical conditions. The practice of number two is eating black seeds. So Islamic teachings actually insist that black seeds should be a part of your daily diet. Abu Huraya states, I have heard from the prophet that there is cure for every disease in black seeds except death. In seed or powder form, kalanji, which is known as fennel flour, can reduce obesity as well as help digestion, treat several digestive disorders, reduce blood pressure, treat congestion, and the kalanji oil has proven to be effective when it comes to reducing joint pain as well as inflammation. And finally, this last practice, eating slow. This is a big one. Like I struggle with this too, because food is just so good. But Islamic teachings encourages followers to eat slowly and chew properly before swallowing because it takes your brain some time to register that your stomach is full. So eating slowly actually ensures that you have not eaten too much before your brain actually receives the signals. Another benefit is that eating slowly and mindfully helps you eat less and it also enhances the pleasure of eating. So if you love food, eat it slow, savor every bite. I'm starting at number 10, we have fasting. Now fasting is obligatory for all healthy adult Muslims during the month of Ramadan. And now a balanced diet improves blood cholesterol, it reduces gastric acidity, it prevents constipation as well as other digestive problems, and it also contributes to an active and healthy lifestyle in general. However, when fasting might significantly affect the health of the person that's fasting or when one is actually like genuinely sick, Islam exempts him or her from fasting. Muslims believe that God does not want to put you in difficulties. Now it's mentioned in the Quran that, oh, you who believe fasting is prescribed to you as it was prescribed to those before you so that you can learn taqwa, which is good deeds and God consciousness. And you can find that in Surah Al-Baqarah, which is Surah 2 verses 183. Now the next practice is prayer at number nine. Now normally this is not seen as a health practice, but there's a whole lot that goes into prayer in Islam. So the repetitive physical movements of Muslim prayer rituals can reduce the chance of lower back pain if you perform them properly. And this is actually according to new research. The study found that not only does quiet prayer eliminate physical anxiety, but the proper knee and back angles can be an effective clinical treatment. So most Muslims worldwide bow, they kneel, and they place their foreheads on the ground in the direction facing Mecca up to five times a day. And one way to think about the movements is that they're similar to those of yoga or physical therapy intervention exercise exercises used to treat lower back pain. And this is according to the co-author of the study, Mohammed Kassane. There is also health practices talking about pandemics in Islam. Now the Prophet Muhammad over 1300 years ago had some recommendations. Now while he wasn't a traditional expert on disease control or anything like that, he actually had some sound advice to prevent and combat the development of things like COVID-19. The Prophet Muhammad was reported to have said this, if you hear of an outbreak of a plague in a land, do not enter it. But if the plague outbreaks out into a place while you are in it, 
do not leave that place. And it's also recorded that he said, those with contagious diseases should be kept away from those who are healthy. Kind of like what we're doing now, self-isolation. I ain't trying to catch no corona. I ain't trying to give no one corona if I had it. At number seven, we have waking up early. Now the Prophet Muhammad prayed to Allah to grant abundance to the community in the early mornings. And he's said these words, Oh Allah, bless my nation in their early mornings. And Allah himself swears by the morning hours before cheering up the Prophet at the beginning of Surah Al-Duha in the Quran. As reported in Sunan Ibn Majah, when the Prophet used to set out his army, he would send them at the beginning of the day. Dr. Al-Gamdi was a man engaged in trade and he used to send his goods out at the beginning of the day and his wealth grew and actually increased. So that's another example of this, starting early in the morning. That's why I get up 5 a.m. Between 5 a.m. and 6 a.m. most mornings. Next up at number six, eating with people. So surprisingly, eating with people is one of Prophet Muhammad's teachings. Now there's scientific evidence that this actually lessens the anxiety and depression as well as it brings families and friends closer together which enhances the emotional side as well as the health side of the human being. At number five, we have drinking water. Islam also talks about drinking water and there are certain ways for that. It's customary to drink with the right hand and also drinking after by sitting as the stomach will not bloat as it gets supported by the stomach cavity in turn, which is supported by the thighs. Also drinking in three sips is recommended. I don't fully understand the whole science behind this, but that's a surprising health practice that it's shown to have benefits for you. There's also a practice of keeping the lid on utensils. So stressing on proper care of kitchen utensils, the Prophet Muhammad actually had something to say about that. He says, cover up the utensils and tie the mouth of the water skins. This prevents contamination from passing insects and lizards and the houses with open kitchens keep straight animals away from the food. Pretty common sense, but I just found it interesting because it was also mentioned in Islam as well. Also oh. enjoying a nap in the afternoon. Now the Prophet Muhammad was in the habit of sleeping for a while after lunch and encouraged his companions and followers to do the same. Narrated in the Islamic traditions of the Hadith, it says Umm Salaim used to spread a leather sheet for the Prophet and he used to take a midday nap on that leather sheet at her home. Now, a short midday nap gives relief for the vital organs of the body, including the heart and brain. And we're not talking about tucking yourself into bed and having like this long sleep. Save that for bedtime, but we're just talking about like power naps. You've heard the term power naps before. Yep, that's in Islam as well. Also treating a fever with a cold water is a practice. Now this practice is where you apply a cold or ice pack to your forehead when you're suffering from a fever. According to Sahih al-Bukhari, fever is from the heat of hell. So put it out, cool it with water. Elevated body temperatures can prove fatal beyond a certain point and applications of cold water can bring them down to normal really, really, really fast. And the final Ooh. practice I want to mention is using honey to treat infections. In verse 69 of Surah Al-Nal in the Quran, it mentions it as healing for mankind for good reason. Honey offers incredible antiseptic, antioxidant, and immune boosting properties for our body and health. It not only fights infection and helps tissue healing, but it also helps reduce inflammation, even helping to cure coughs and flus, and also even treat acne. There's a whole lot of positive uses for honey, not just for sweetening your tea or putting it on your toast. Oh, it tastes so good. Fasting has many surprising benefits that some people may not even be aware of. Now, more people are becoming more aware of these benefits. So we can see why this is also a practice that the religion of Islam really promotes. Starting at number 10, we have metabolism. So one of the more obvious results of fasting is reducing obesity. And now fasting, it causes the liver enzymes to break break down cholesterol and fats to convert them into bile acid. And then from there, it converts them to heat and then it, that stimulates faster metabolism. Fasting on top of that also, it decreases the appetite, which reduces the hunger hormone levels in the body. So oftentimes people find that their meal portion sizes are smaller after a period of fasting. 
Also, when the human body is undergoing the starvation process, what the body does is that it goes after the fat in order to utilize and burn any stored energy first. So if done correctly, fasting can actually contribute greatly to the loss of fatty tissues in the body. So you're gonna lose a lot of weight. Moving on to the next benefit, it corrects high blood pressure. Now, fasting is one of the non-drug methods that are used to reduce blood pressure. It helps to reduce the risk of atherosclerosis. Now, atherosclerosis is the clogging of arteries by fat particles. During the fasting process, glucose and later fat stores are used to produce energy, right? So metabolic rate is reduced during fasting and the fear flight hormones such as adrenaline as well as noradrenaline are also reduced. And this keeps the metabolic rate steady and within its limits. So the benefit of this is the reduction in blood pressure. All right, getting a little bit more medical and scientific, it also promotes detox. Detoxification. We know processed foods aren't the best thing. Now, processed foods, a lot of times they have additives in them. Hence the term processed food. Now, processed food may taste really, really good, not gonna lie, but you see these additives, they may become toxins in the body. Now, most of these toxins are then stored in fats. Fat is burned during fasting, like I mentioned previously, especially when it is prolonged and the toxins are released. So the liver and the kidneys and other organs in the body are involved in the detoxification process as well. Fasting also rests the digestive system. Now during the fasting process, the digestive organs actually get to take a break and just chill a little bit, you know? The normal physiological functions continue to happen, especially the production of digestive secretions, but they happen at a very reduced rate. Fasting helps to maintain balance of fluids in the body and breakdown of food takes place, but at a steady rate. Now the release of energy also follows a gradual process. Fasting, however, does not stop the production of acids in the stomach. So this is a reason why people that have peptic ulcers are advised to be extra careful when fasting. And some medical experts say that they shouldn't be fasting at all. Now, the next thing to know is that fasting also really affects the function of cells, genes, and hormones. So when you don't eat for a while, several things start to happen in your body. Like for example, your body then initiates important cellular repair processes and it then changes hormone levels to make the stored body fat a lot more accessible. So here's some of the changes that happen in your body when you fast. This is pretty interesting. When it comes to insulin levels, the blood levels of insulin drop significantly and this helps to facilitate fat burning. Then there's also the effect on the human growth hormone. So the blood levels of growth hormones may increase as much as five times. Higher levels of this hormone facilitate fat burning as well as muscle gain. And it has many other benefits that I'm not gonna take the time to mention in this episode. You have to just like, Google that or something. The body starts to induce important cellular repair processes such as removing waste material from the cells. Then there is gene expression. So there are a handful of beneficial changes in several genes and molecules related to longevity as well as protection against all kinds of disease. So many of the benefits of fasting are related to these changes in hormones, gene expression, as well as function of cells. At number five, let's talk about self-restraint. So fasting has not been prescribed according to the religion of Islam simply for dietary reasons and medical reasons, but rather fasting is actually an act of worship to God in order to teach mankind self-restraint. So Muslims believe that fasting is not just for Muslims, it's for all people. In addition to restraining from food and drinks, people must work on being more patient and forgiving while they fast. Muslims are required to refrain from all kind of useless talk and gossip. They're compelled to be kinder and more generous to others as well as utilize and construct their time a lot wiser. So the person fasting becomes more aware of their words 
and their actions. The benefit number four is self-esteem. It's believed that the practice of fasting allows Muslims to grow spiritually and also grow socially. There are numerous benefits to fasting and it's even documented and highly encouraged by many professionals. So one of the benefits, like I mentioned, is self-esteem because it is intended to remind Muslims of their purpose in this life, which is to worship and surrender to the will of God. Now this really boosts a Muslim's confidence as well as it purifies them from any sort of self-centered behavior and it leads to an overall more content life. The next benefit of fasting in the religion of Islam is it actually may help overcome addictions. So similar to the benefit number five on self-restraint, some experts show that fasting can actually help addicts reduce their cravings for things like nicotine, alcohol, caffeine, as well as other substances that they abuse. Although there are other practices to reduce addictions, fasting can actually play an important role. But despite having all of these benefits, so it's important to mention the flip side of fasting because it may cause reduction in body water called dehydration. So this can lead to headaches and it can even trigger migraines in those who are predisposed to those kind of things as well as pregnant women, nursing mothers, and people who are malnourished, and people who have renal or liver problems are advised not to fast. So you definitely also wanna check up with your medical professionals. Fasting does have its benefits, but again, like everything, it needs to be done in a certain way for you to maximize it. Fasting helps to promote a healthier brain and cognitive function. So during the fasting process, the blood in the human body is actually filled with more endorphins and then in turn, it gives you a feeling of well-being and great mental health. And the overall effects of fasting has a similar impact on the brain as like physical exercise. So to kind of narrow it down a little bit more, fasting really forms one of the five key pillars in Islam, especially fasting during the month of Ramadan, which is actually obligatory for all able-bodied Muslims. However, if you do wish to incorporate any type of fasting at any other time of the year, it's important to remember to plan your fasting structure very carefully. Be, of course, very realistic about what you want to achieve and always ensure that you're in the right mental and physical mindset to be able to reap the full benefits of fasting. Also ensure that you get enough sleep and ensure that your stress levels are low. So yeah, that was just a little bit more points to make a note of. But overall, if you do fasting the way it is designed, definitely Muslims say that there is a huge benefit, especially in their brain function. They're able to focus a lot clearer and become overall better people as a result.